back. Now, the energy in the room is about to be disrupted, and we can find no better individual to introduce a team of radical thinkers, alternative planners, and people who see the world differently. Um, real estate is the world's largest asset class. It has a history of thousands of years, but where does it go to from now? So introduce, to introduce a team of radical players, it's a great pleasure to welcome a friend and colleague of mine, Mr. Neil Peterson, Editor-in-Chief of the Real Estate Invest Magazine. Welcome to you, Neil. Morning, everybody. Um, I hope to, to lift the energy a little bit, as Kura said, um, um, when we look at the economy and what's happening in the markets and that kind of stuff, there are realities, yes, uh, but there are also massive opportunities. And I think today, one of the biggest disruptors in real estate today and in the world is technology. It's changing the way that we are doing business. And I hope to share some of the things, and there's quite a few trends which are happening over there, but I'm not going to be the one that's just going to be sharing. I'm going to be bringing up the disruptors, and we're going to start looking at the different sectors where this disruption model is happening. And it's very real. And if we don't start moving in the same direction, um, we will certainly fall behind, and our businesses could become irrelevant going forward. So we have to recognize it, we have to look at ways how we can digitize and use technology to, to best effect. So, when we start looking at where we are right now, we are in the digital age. For those of you who didn't realize it, we, we are. We've moved from the industrial age to the information age, to the digital age, and it's moving at a rapid pace and uh, moving faster than we can. We tend to just look at things overseas, but there's a lot of things happening right there in South Africa. And the world's most valuable asset right now is data. It's not oil. So it's the way, it's all the different technologies from the social media, how Facebook can actually identify very specific ways that we, what we are looking for. We're looking for 200,000 pound property to 400,000 pound properties online. Technology can identify it and it can communicate better to us. So data can give us a lot of information about us. Computers will become more intelligent than humans by 2030. Can you believe it? And I'm going to introduce you one of the models as well, where it's disrupting both in the healthcare industry and also in the legal industry right now. So believe it or not, that is the prediction going forward. Computers will be more intelligent than us. So let's just look at some of the disruptors that are affecting us out there at the moment. So there's governance in terms of political situation. And that we spoke a little bit about this morning. There's economic growth because we've got to grow all the time. We cannot just be standing still and saying, well, this is the scenario. We've got to look at new and different ways of growing. Environment, and I'll expand a little bit on these a little bit now. Social, then of course technology, which we're going to be spending a lot of time on, and transport. So, we look at governance and we see what's happening in the world that there's a geopolitical scenario that is happening right now. In other words, a lot of countries like in the UK, they're so focused on Brexit, they're focused on themselves. So it tends to be local issues which they're looking at first. Although Donald Trump is trying his best to go to war with North Korea right now, um, through a lot of his sort of outspoken statements at the moment. The same thing in South Africa. We're so inward focused. But we've got to realize that actually the world economy is in a very similar position all around the world. And we tend to become a little bit insular about that. Okay? Um, if we just started looking at economic growth, I thought I would uh, show you a short clip from an expert who has got a view on the world and specifically on the U.S. right now. The last time we had a discussion, I think it was August 2015, uh, you predicting that there's going to be a, a, a long, long recession, a financial crisis, a crash, a financial crash. What I predicted has already happened. See, when people look at crashes, it doesn't always appear in the stock market or the real estate market and all this. It can appear in the bond market. And right now, it's the FX market for an exchange. So that's why the RAND is now going to be 13 something to the dollar. Yes. That means your currency is crashing. Yeah. And that means people don't. They don't want to do business with South Africa. Yeah. And if everybody was doing business with South Africa, the RAND would be up at 7 again, or 8, and yeah. in that range. So you guys aren't crashing, but so is the world crashing. And so my predictions are coming true. And um, 
It's a frightening time. I believe it for me. It's, it's, it's so frightening because I don't know where the next shoe is going to drop. It could be a terrorist hit. Mm. You know, it could be anything like that. It could be uh, one of those things that EMPs, electromagnetic pulse, that wipes out the uh, global grid, which is predicted. In America today, more retailers have closed this year than after 2008. And uh, the things I'm concerned about is I do have hotels. Airbnb is wiping them out. You know what I mean? So I've got to be very, very careful today. So what do you think will be the effects if that American economy crashes first? Do you predict it could happen in America first? It's already happening, so I'm not say it. I mean, people just don't see it's it. It's not official. We apparently are in technical recession in South Africa. I know. It's all the places. Mm -hmm. They just don't report it that way. Yeah. You see, the, our, our treasury, our, it's how they report. Mm -hmm. They say unemployment's not at 4%. It's actually at 19%. Because they lie. Mm -hmm. Our government's lying to us. I mean, I'll talk about the U.S. government. <laughs> but that's what my friend here, Trump, is fighting. <laughs> Trump once said he's a good friend of mine, but he has a disease I have. <laughs> it's a disease called you put your foot in your mouth, you know what I mean? Yeah. And because he can't stand, he's not politically correct. He tweets and says things he really shouldn't say. Yet, there's a class of people that love him. Right. You know, and most people hate him. So, I think what, what he's really trying to say, that also crashes are opportunities. And we've got to recognize it, and we've got to see how we could actually respond to that. But yes, that's the economic situation. If we start looking at other things like environment, and uh, particularly if we start looking at green buildings and the performance of green buildings, they certainly outperforming black buildings um, as much by 140 basis points. And uh, it's now come through, certainly on the balance sheets, that green buildings are performing. But it's more than that. It's also about mixed use and how people actually interact. And, uh, and we saw this morning, we heard this morning, that there's a massive need um, for uh, mixed use kind of, and where people can interact a lot better, and where they've got access to transport, and uh, they also have a social life around that. Social, so that's also parks, and those kind of things that we've got to take uh, consideration of. It's not just the social media that we're talking about. We're talking about how people actually interact in cities, and smart cities are certainly changing the way how things move there. So, um, if we look at education and uh, education online, we see that it's impacting the way the world is going in terms of where education is going. So, certainly if you start looking at the different types of education that is out there, we just look at something like IBM Watson. IBM Watson is a, a, a portal where you can get legal advice and up to 90% of that advice that you're getting is accurate compared to only 70% compared to humans. So eventually getting advice and education, the online environment is going to be changing rapidly. Right. The rest of this clip. So we're talking about smart cities and, um, and if we start looking at what's impacting in, in smart cities, we see that it is transportation. There's talk about driverless cars and how that's going to impact going forward. And each city is just trying to find that solution where instead of living an hour and an hour and a half sitting in traffic each day, we've got carbon emissions, all that kind of stuff. There's only a third of the people in the world in, in most cities that actually own vehicles, yet 100% of the roads are actually dedicated towards giving those, uh, those, those, uh, the transportation to the cars, to the vehicles, giving them the access that they need. Okay, so what is the future of investment? Certainly, we look at people are moving around a lot more than they used to. They're more mobile. And because of technology, it's got nothing to do with the place or where you reside anymore. Because you could be living two or three hours away from where you live. And, uh, but you can still, if, as long as you've got an internet connection, connection, you can still get the job done at the end of the day. And this is where the world is moving dramatically. Um, so to either in cities where people are living to places where they work, or if they're living far away, they still can be productive. But that's not everybody's privilege. Then if we start looking at investing global, there are now ways and means that you can go online 
through various uh, uh, methodologies. Because we hear some from some of the experts now in terms of blockchain, in terms of that technology going forward, of how you can invest locally at the click of a button, where all the research, all the information that you need has been done, all the due diligence, and it's really just clicking the button and knowing that that investment is going to work for you. And you overcome all the regulatory environments, all the various other hoops that you've got to jump through when you are as an individual investor. So these things are all realities. And we've got to embrace it to say, well, okay, well, how can we implement this in our particular business online that we can actually fast track the process? And it's certainly going to be the quicker one that's going to maybe, <coughs> that's going to be doing all the deals at the end of the day. Okay, if we start looking what's happening in retail, and uh, we've seen the growth of, of e-commerce, and that's having a massive impact on shopping malls. And in fact, shopping malls have now become the end result of what you're going to do at the end, which restaurant you're going to go to, what kind of entertainment that you're going to have, rather than the shops that you're actually going to visit. And uh, it's still putting that particular market under a lot of pressure, and there's still some market sectors in Africa that are still doing really well. But, uh, but certainly the, the growth of e-commerce is, is a massive factor. We still start seeing an office where we see co-working environments uh, increasing. Uh, we will get the likes of Regis and WeWork and those kind of businesses where you get a hot desk and you literally use that desk for the time that you use for the time that you need it as opposed to paying a monthly rental and having that kind of overhead for you because we've got such a mobile businessman nowadays. Hospitality, growth in house sharing, we're seeing Airbnb and obviously the impact of that that it's having, and you heard Kiyosaki say the impact it's having on his investments and a lot of other investments there. So it's a major, major disruptor out there. FinTech, what is it essentially? It's computer programs and other technology used to support to enable banking and traditional services. So what's happened is that it's now moved for, through this called blockchain. <coughs> And, uh, and Scott will share a little bit about blockchain, which is really a secure transaction way of putting your money through to add value at the end of the day. So I say PropTech is certainly the new, the PropTech is the new FinTech. It's certainly taking over the way it's moving the world. So if we start looking, what is PropTech? It's a wave of companies using technologies to refine, improve, or reinvent the services we rely on to the property industry to buy, rent, sell, build, or manage residential and commercial properties. PropTech is here. And if we just start using some examples, if we look in the car industry, particularly Mercedes-Benz, Daimler, Chrysler, they say the new competitors are, are the likes of Tesla, Apple, Amazon, Google. Those are their competitors at the end of the day. It's not another car manufacturer. And with carbon emissions and that kind of stuff, they're becoming almost irrelevant to own a vehicle going forward. And there's another major, major, major shift, and it's called the disintermediation. And in fact, we've got some of the disruptors actually doing this particular process right now, disintermediation. It's a reduction in the use of intermediaries between producers and consumers, for example, by investing directly in the securities market rather than through a bank. So it's obviously cost-cutting all the way through. And uh, this is a massive trend, and it's happened already in the insurance industry, it's in the real estate industry. So if you're a real estate agent, broker, whatever it may be, yes, you are getting slashed all the time in terms of your uh, commission. Virtual and augmented reality, that's a massive reality, and we've got uh, a specialist over here, Vip, who will show us some stuff that's happening in that particular field. What's amazing with augmented reality, the future will be, you will be able to hold up your cell phone against the building, and you can see whether that building is available for rent or not, just by really shifting your fo focus on a particular building. I mean, isn't that amazing technology? So the access to information that you can get is, is real time. <coughs> okay, we've, we've, we've talked about, so we've seen the Uber. It's a major disruptor uh, worldwide. And uh, I don't need to, to talk much about it. To, uh, Airbnb, certainly we've, we've, we've touched a little bit about that. And then, of course, uh, IBM Watson, as I mentioned. And also in the uh, healthcare industry, we're also having a massive impact in terms of diagnosing patients. And it's been proven that they're far more accurate than humans in terms of diagnosing patients. So this is a major disruptor. And there's a new one that's coming in. Already Amazon has entered at possible real estate services expansion. 
They have really said they're going to get into this market. Who is that? <laughs> but it's a reality. So ladies and gentlemen, instead of me actually babbling on and carrying on about what those disruptors are, I'm going to introduce you one for one to those disruptors in the market. So if I could ask, first of all, Kristen Ingalls of Property Fox to please step up. If you could put your hands together for one of our property disruptors, Kristen, please get into the question. to what we do, uh, and later on we'll have a panel where we can maybe get to it in a little bit more depth. Um, essentially, um, our business is best described as an online real estate platform to allow people to sell their home easier, to sell it quicker, and to sell it for a lot more. And maybe important for us to realize why we arrived at the need for designing something like this. Myself and my partner looked at the industry, which has interestingly remained largely unchanged for about 40 years. The way we've sold property in South Africa and across the world is just innovated elements of it, but not really. Uh, and so we looked at it and said, how can we bring the price down? How can we make the services more consistent, and better, uh, and more professional in every, in every sphere? And we spent a great deal of time on it, and the only way we worked out that we could do that was by redesigning the entire model, which is exactly what we did. Uh, and our offering is best described as you as a seller being able to sell your home for one and a half percent commission, and we want to make that even cheaper further on the line. And you're able to sell it faster, it's more transparent. You, as a seller, are more involved in your process. And we felt that was really important because most South Africans' most valuable asset is their home. So how can you not be more involved in your sales process? And, and the only way we were able to do that is to now put ourselves in a position which is also probably best described as in between a traditional real estate agency and if you just listed your home online and sold it yourself. So it's very important for us to say that the solution that we've come up with and the platform we've developed is very much not a do-it-yourself. It's very much exactly how it's been done. We just are able to now offer you things like um, professional photography. We have a freelance network across the country. Um, we have a scheduling department, which is where the tech starts coming in. Much like Airbnb, if you want to book a viewing uh, at a home at 2 o'clock on a Thursday, you click 2 o'clock and the seller will then accept. Uh, and then the tech kicks in and that's when we start supplying all the useful data involved in what we call a valuation process rather than a simple valuation. And that's because data, price, value is always changing. And it's changing so quickly uh, that it's very difficult for you, especially in a time when sometimes it takes you up to a year to sell your home to stay on a certain valuation. Uh, and then just lastly, I wanted to touch on the fact that the process we've developed has happened so quickly now that you as a seller can come to us and within under 48 hours, your home will be listed on every major property website across the country. Uh, and in many cases, we already have them sold uh, within 24 hours after that. Uh, and that is all able and possible due to building our business on the foundation of technology. Thanks. Thanks. Just grab a seat over here, Chris. Next up. Okay, so while we've got pregnant pauses over here, I think Ben, just come up and, and just uh, tell us a little. This is Ben. Put your hands together for Ben of House Me. So, as these guys are disruptors, they're changing the industry. Um, ben, you do the introduction. We'll get the slides going. We don't need all this. We've got the microphone to take over. Hi, guys. Um, by a show of hands, who has heard of House Me? Okay, so, so not, not too many people. So, um, so my name's Ben. Uh, House Me was founded in the end of 2015. What we do um, is we 
facilitate a process for tenants to find property. So we are in residential rental. Thanks very much. We're in residential rental, uh, and we are a uh, online platform for managing your rental. So if you remember the last time you were a tenant, uh, perhaps you're looking for a property, um, you would have dashed around town maybe during your lunch break, a deposit in hand, um, possibly you know your ID, your CV, proof of employment, a blood sample for good measure, uh, just hoping that the landlord would, would let you in and, and that you get the, the, first, the first place you're looking for. Likewise, on a landlord side, you're desperately concerned that a tenant is not credible, is going to damage your property, won't pay on time, and you won't get a fair price. There's a lot of problems in that. We hope to solve them by building a tech platform. The slide up here actually just shows you what we're trying to do, where we're positioning ourselves. We've used technology to position ourselves not just as a consolidated platform, but a more efficient one. So the way HouseMe works, we uh, allow t uh, landlords to list their properties, we verify them as individuals, we then vet the property, make sure they own it, and then post it, as Crispin pointed out, for, for his sales. Likewise, all of the rentals on the major marketplaces across the country for free, there's no cost. And then we facilitate the process where we, where we go and vet tenants. And we're able to do that using technology. They come and they place a bid on what they're willing to pay. Now that bid starts at the landlord set reserve price and increases from there until the highest bidding tenant wins. All of these tenants are vetted and credit worthy. And we can do this within, uh, I think it's, it's a bit simpler in your rental, how fast this is, about four hours. This is where we think the, the change is going to happen. This is our fundamental belief. If you disagree with this slide, you certainly wouldn't want to talk to me afterwards. Um, we believe that technology is changing the rental industry, and we believe that efficiency is going to come in, whether or not it is housing, we, obviously we hope it is. But we're moving from a transition of sort of 10, 12, in some cases 15, we have it here at 18%. That's what the ag agencies are, cha uh, are charging to do what we do at 2.5% a month which includes not only the auction, but also a rental guarantee. Uh, and Neil spoke a bit earlier about the data that we're able to collect. That's exactly how we're able to drive those prices uh, and how the, the industry is going to change. So we're for the change you today. Great, thank you very much, Ben. Put your hands together for Ben. Is there an opportunity to have some questions for now? Okay, our next uh, disruptor is Scott Picken of Wealth Migrate. And uh, just give you a slide. Morning, everyone. According to stats, less than 1% of you in this room are going to retire wealthy. The reason is, is that the system is broken. If you take the average property system, there's 16 different middlemen between the investment and yourself. There's high fees, there's low trust, there's a lack of transparency, and most importantly, there's no alignment. And that's the last one. <coughs> we decided to change that. We decided to put you, the investor, directly in contact with the best property providers in South Africa and globally. We decided to make global real estate investing easy. No longer worrying about the hassles of management, tax, structuring, compliance. All that you can focus on is the best partners with the best opportunities from as little as $1,000. You can literally now focus on the best returns from your bedroom. There's four simple steps. You sign up, you choose the investments you want, you do the transaction online, and the part I like most is you manage your global portfolio in one place. Whether it's America, England, Australia, or South Africa, you get to choose. The problem is, is that there's multiple platforms out there. And just like Uber and Airbnb, I don't want to have to have a different app for every country I go to. We created the solution where you can have a global portfolio. We've now got members from 100 countries, investors from 40 countries. We've had $62 million through the platform, and we've, num we've won a number of awards, including the KPMG. Our due diligence system is world class. It helps people know where to invest, when to invest, how to invest, and who to invest with. And the board is with a bunch of names that you recognize. Justin Clark from Private Property, Paul Nadero, one of the top guys in compliance, Dr. Dolph DeRus from Real Estate Riches, and Henny Besaidno and Peter Fenstra, two of the more recognized people in South African property. The returns, yes, you can get far better returns with technology. That's 10% cash on cash medical buildings in America, 
that's 11.22, that's 8.49, that's 8.29, that's cash in your pocket. And to conclude, if you think that the world is getting interesting, it's about to get a whole lot more interesting. Blockchain is going to change the way that you understand life. And last week, Wednesday, we actually launched a cryptocurrency. If anyone understands the volatility of Bitcoin, and if it confuses you, imagine a cryptocurrency that was based on real estate, which we all understand. Thanks. Thanks very much, Scott. Okay, so put your hands together for Scott. Uh, Bumpy uh, runs a company called Niche Communications. Um, he's the virtual reality guy. So Bumpy, you've got uh, the mic. Maybe just do the intro while we get the, your video. Thank you, everybody. Uh, yes, like Neil said, I work for Niche Communications. Uh, I've been doing so for, since 2003, both in the UK and in SA. Uh, we specialize in property marketing, um, 2D, 3D floor plans, digital photography, brochure design and print, and we've recently entered in the VR space with our 3D virtual reality tours, which is powered by uh, Matterport. Um, if we can get the video, then we can just showcase some of the products and services. And can run with it. We're now going to have a debate, we're going to have a discussion. Um, Alright, we're going to be debating technology going forward. I'm going to give the mic to you, Crispin. Okay, so Crispin, uh, we've got Sam over there. Yeah. Alright, so there's all the mics. Crispin, so property box, um, it's, is this, this is certainly disrupting the traditional um, estate agent space. The first question I've got, is this the end of relationships between people? Do I have to sit in a computer all day to, to select my property? Um, I mean, we're talking about 1.5% but minimum 35,000, am I right? Yeah. So first of all, the first question is, is this the end of the personal interaction between people? Is the, is the people thing out of it? I think uh, the best way to describe that is, um, firstly, selling your home is always going to be emotional. And I think that's been our biggest challenge is to work out how to design a model and a platform where we can maintain that personal touch when you are selling your home when there isn't a person involved. And just to clarify, 
what we managed to do is to design a platform where there isn't physically an agent and the first thing you'll be thinking of is, well, how do you show my home? And that is one of the big um, mind shifts we needed to do. Um, there are two big ones. One is we needed the public to realize that it's okay to just open your door and let someone walk through their home uh, and facilitate most of their own doings. Uh, that was the first thing. And the second thing is, is we needed to change the model completely because 7% as an example is very expensive, but it has to be 7% because there's no uh, upfront obligation from a client. And so an agent needs to list three or four or five or six homes and incur costs and then will only sell one or two of them. And the trouble with the model is, is that you as a client and as a seller are then paying all the defaults of the other agencies. And so how we've changed it is we have a simple small registration fee which uh, is part of the one and a half percent. But what it does do is it pays for that professional service that you get. It pays for freelance professional photography. It pays for our platform that allows, that helps you with your evaluation. And then it pays for our facilitation platform which helps you the host experience. And ultimately brings down the cost of selling one's home dramatically. Which when you've listened to all the talks and all the panels earlier, it becomes incredibly important when you're investing money in property. Absolutely. Okay, Ben, um, the 2.5% model for property management, and now you look at property managers out there, they're looking at you, they think, are you crazy? What I have to do, I've got the runaround, there's all that admin, there's all those, uh, the maintenance and absolutely everything that you need to do to be able to manage a property. You're doing it for 2.5%. Is it viable, first of all, and what are you doing to, to disrupt this? It's a major disruptor because this gives investors value straight back. Yeah, so, so that's 100% right. Um, what we've done really is, is three things uniquely. The first is we have built a technology platform that's scalable. So, so the biggest difference, and I know it's a horribly overused word, um, but the biggest difference between a, a traditional or an archaic system and a technology-enabled system, I think is, is the correct buzzword, um, is, is that technology can scale. That means with one staff member, I could do maybe four or five, we're actually now at about 12 times what an agent can do without our tools. So that's the first thing that we can do, and that's why we can we can pass on cost savings. <coughs> Excuse me. The second thing that we do is uh, we're incredibly data hungry. So all of the, the efficiencies that you might have only found out about ten years into running your business, we are finding out in month two or three because we're actually crunching the numbers all the time, and not just sort of uh, you know this this deal closed sooner than that deal. But to give an example, before ten has been placed on, in a house me uh, in a house me rental, we have about thirteen different metrics captured on it and we'll continue to build that over time. And then the, the third thing is, uh, we fundamentally believe that, uh, I'm not sure what Chris was earlier, the residential uh, rental model is broken and has been for a time. So you say 7% because I've been sold, well I say 10% is far too much uh, when you actually look at the, the work that goes into renting a home. And we've managed to break it down into very um, clear silos, and each of those silos we can cost separately and then, and then do it while at scale. Great. Okay, Scott, blockchain, Cryptocurrencies, it's a big thing at the moment. Um, this is a new game for b to real estate. Uh, it's, it's a speciality. I mean, I believe anything you've got to invest in, you've got to understand where it is. Maybe just enlighten us with blockchain, because it, it's had quite a good run. Was it up, up was it 3% or something? Um, that was, was, was up, but it's, I know it was about a year ago, it was about $1,000 for to buy a Bitcoin. And now I think it's is it a four thousand, is it up or is it down? I haven't really been monitoring it, but how, how do we attach the two with, with, with real estate? How do we how did let's explain, elaborate a little bit and, and share that with the audience out here? So there's two ways I'll answer that. The first one is that Bitcoin on the 1st of September hit $5,000 to Bitcoin. Uh, yesterday it was $4,000, so it lost 20%, uh, which is the volatility I'm talking about. But for the people in this room, we are not at uh, the Rotary Cryptocurrency Convention. And so I want to bring it back to property and, and the simplicity of it. In simple terms, guys, when, when you catch a car, I came here by Uber, I don't actually know how the algorithms put me and the car together take the payments and everything. I just go from a place A to B in a safe and simple way. It's trustworthy, transparent, and cost effective. That's all I care about. And secure. And secure, yeah. So let's take a step back. And, you know, it was 2009, I was in Bondi Beach. I was with Henry Desaid and Peter Fenstra, and they were buying student accommodation, medical centers, and shopping centers. I'd helped thousands of people buy houses and apartments. And, and I said to them, why medical? And they said, well, because doctors are very economically resilient. 
They never leave. Like they, if you think about doctors, they're there forever. And doctors are good at being doctors, but not being accountants, so they sign with favorable leases. And I remember thinking, that is an absolute no-brainer. Like, why has no one ever taught me that? Um, I was like, cool, I'm in. How much do I have to participate to play? And I remember hearing attorneys turning to me and goes, oh, it's just for friends and family. It's five million Australian dollars each. I was like, aha, there's the cash. So let's not get caught up on Bitcoin, blockchain, or cryptocurrency. All that we've done is through technology enable people to invest with what previously only billionaires could invest in, or millionaires if you've got 500, 5 million Aussie dollars. But now you can do it from a thousand rand, a thousand dollars. You get the exact same experience, the exact same relative return. And I think that's what's important. Um, if we look at uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, is this the end of the show us? The, the show day, come and see the property. I hope so, uh, that we do business for us. Uh, but just alluding to what Chris would have said earlier as well, it's, uh, especially in the African market, the agent spends a lot of time at a show, there's safety concerns. With virtual reality, you can access that property anytime, anytime, on any device, either with your VR headset or on your mobile phone. Um, so yeah, that's, I, I personally think it's going to reduce the amount of shows we have. Agents might not agree with me, but you can showcase so much more at any time. I mean, there's stats that you can show 15 properties in 15 minutes, and then a person can make an educated decision before actually setting foot in the car to go and view the property. So your clients are developers, estate agents, who are your typical clients? Typical clients is real estate agents, but we've uh, done hospitality, we've done spas, we've done, you name it, we've done them, showrooms. Soon to show off my bread. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. Okay, I'm now going to put it out there to the floor, and I'm sure there are questions, and uh, so just mention, just, if you can just put up your hand, you go to Mike Runner. Um, somebody want to ask a question, a disruptive question? Come on, there must be one there. I'll just take this mic over here. I'll ask you to be the runner there, please, uh, Rustam. Just look around the room over there. Jenny? Uh, Chris, this is for you, and I think also extending to you, Ben, just in terms of the safety factor. So obviously you've got this great technology and you've got your house on the virtual space. Uh, as a seller, how do you vet or actually screen a potential buyer coming through? Who are they? We don't know who they are. You know, as a single woman, maybe it's nothing that I really want to do. And the same thing would explain to you, Ben, is it a similar vetting situation you've got for your tenants and your landlords? We, that was also one of our biggest challenges. And we looked at the status quo once again and said what measures uh, is the traditional model and what, what does it have in place to to increase the safety and we looked so show houses i think in my opinion is kind of right out because that's more or less an advertised buffet for crime if that's if you know if you're worried about safety then i would say don't have a show house um but from the individual viewings what we've done is we've partnered with a firm called this is me and essentially what we do for every single seller and of course every single buyer is do a basic id check and simply we can puts your ID number into a system and it returns uh, not a credit check, we need obviously uh, authorization for that, but what it does do is it gives us a basic ID check that says John Smith is John Smith. And people always say, is that going to be enough for you uh, for security? And, and our view is that facilitating someone who actually doesn't have a check at all in the traditional model isn't necessarily a safety. Having a, an agent walk you to a house is not a measure of safety, maybe sort of, but, but there are not any checks being done there. We've employed a physical ID and a basic background check on every single seller, a buyer that goes to any house. So we know who we're selling, who we're selling. And there are some red flags that easily come up. Um, so we, we do the same thing, we use a different company. We also do a, a phone check, which is interesting. Um, the phone companies have almost as much data as government by each person, so we can actually do sort of some double. The, the alternative, the option we actually launched about two months ago is you can also hire what we affectionately call house me helpers who will do the videos for you and that would uh, effectively replace the information if you so wish to have a third party. Great, we've got a question at the back there. Sorry, can I just say one thing? Think about Uber and Airbnb. Like, I've had five ladies in South Africa drive me at night in an Uber. That would never have happened in the past. Like, I'm here in Cape Town, there's people living in our house right now. Again, that would never have happened. Technology takes away risk, and, and we all use it all the time, and therefore why can we not use it for investing as well? Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. Um, so, 
in, in certainly in the three speakers instances, a huge amount of data must be being produced and intelligence into what might uh, what the demands are of property and rental and ownership and how this might indicate some changes and how the market responds to that demand. Are you sharing data? Are you making that data available? Are you using that data in a way that is useful for the property sector more broadly? We, we don't share data. Um, so your question has actually got two parts. The first is, is it useful for a company to collect it and use it internally? Of course, that, that's actually, a technology company has to do that. The second point on sharing data and making it useful outside, um, our, our view in this, the housing perspective, is that the best use of data is to, for us to understand our clients better and then offer them services that they want, as opposed to, which is happening in other companies and particularly out of South Africa, selling that data onto someone and letting them decide. That's actually, in, in, uh, according to the Poppy Act, illegal in any case. So, so we very much store it, we keep it, uh, and, and our, our users are, are in control. We, we, we actually have taken a slightly different approach in that we, we share a lot of our data with our clients. And one of the ways we've tried to innovate in the valuation space, which is always a difficult space, is to be able to extend all of our activity data on your listings to our clients. And so, the age-old question that went to an agent was, why is my house not selling? And then there would be three or four or five different theories about why that wasn't selling. But in our case, what we do is we spend a great deal of time on your representation. So using amazing technology like what Vimpy as an example would be one way in which one can do that. And what you then do is if you are getting 300 views on your home, but nobody is calling you for a viewing, um, then you know that perhaps the only other factor might be your price, and then you can reduce that, which is part of how we work on our valuation process. So there are no decisions made. And in fact, one of the results is that our clients now phone us and say, I think I need to reduce the price of my house, which is a wonderful place for us to be versus where an agent is telling a homeowner that they think their house is too expensive, which is always difficult and always sensitive. Hey, Chris, over here. So I think technology has the potential to help us move very quickly in our sectors, but a big disruptor to that is lawmakers. How are you as innovators approaching lawmakers to grow that? I'll just uh, briefly mention that we obviously need to adhere to the State Agency Affairs Board Act and and so we spent a great deal of time spending with them and making sure we comply but it is challenging at times because a lot of what we do is no, wrong, no longer reflective in things like the, uh, the Act. So it's a process. Uh, innovation, that's always going to be a challenge in whatever industry we're in, but uh, it's an active one that we spend a great deal of time with the boards of. Yeah, that, that probably has been our biggest challenge. I wrote my dissertation in 1998 at UCT on how technology was going to change the property industry. And when we launched uh, Wealth Migrate in 2010, for three and a half years we were trying to work out the compliance, because it's not difficult in one country, imagine trying to go cross-border. And we've gone as far as being one of the founding members of the African Crowdfunding Association. We've tried everything locally to, to change the rules or help them change. And nothing really has changed in South Africa. So the way that we've solved the problem is that the platform is digitally integrated with a listed regulated exchange. So in a country like South Africa where there's just securities laws, there's no fintech, no crowdfunding, nothing. Um, one can be compliant using what we call old world traditional regulation. And then in countries like England or America or Malaysia or New Zealand, where they're forward thinking, they've got new age fintech or crowdfunding, we then have built it on blockchain and comply with that. So it allows us to be compliant per country depending on the regulation per country. We don't have to wait for the regulators to expand globally. So Scott, how do you define that? What do you call that? That uh, collective investment? Oh, uh, so, so, so... I mean, if we had to put it in a category. Yeah, so, so it's... So it's actually, we've, we've created a term for it called collaborative smart investing. So collaborative investing is a well-known term of how people should invest and have done so very successfully over the years. We've added a smart component to it. And it's not crowdfunding and it's not the risk listed regulated environment. It's all of it put together to create a global solution using technology. We've got a question over there, the last one. And just, okay, two more I'm gonna take. We'll take one there, one there, then we'll have it closed. So, Colin? Awesome, thank you so much for the information. I'd like to know, I'm actually looking for Trijal. That's below market value. How can this technology actually assist me in that? 
Sorry, just repeat the question, Nicole. I'm looking for property below market value that could actually. Below market value? Yeah. Okay. So anybody can do that. <laughs> <laughs> We've got an auction no. happening over here. But the, the, the challenge is, is the technology is going to take that arbitrage out of the market. Yes. Uh, right now, if you want to play a game, go look at property prices and then go look at Airbnb rentals and play the arbitrage yes. in that market. Uh, you've got to troll yourself really to uh, you get to be a uh, push ups, unfortunately. So I'm going to scream, I'm below market value. <laughs> okay, Thanks, we've got a question over here. There is another one, yes. Okay, I'm going to take two more. One over there as well. So, so that's the one. Perhaps the question I'm going to answer might ask might answer your question. Um, a couple of years ago at this forum, we heard about uh, Go Industry Dovebird's online auction platform coming to South Africa. It was going to take the market by storm. It was going to be the best thing in auctioning that had ever hit South Africa. And it was built on the back of a very sophisticated platform in the USA, which does work very well. And I've recently been chatting to them and said, well, why hasn't it? You know, a couple of people ventured into it. It really hasn't worked yet in South Africa. So I'm staring at you, but I mean, this question is for all of you. Um, I'm going to, my question is, are any of you looking at the auction industry? Or if you are not, why not? What has failed in the online um, execution of, of auction, the auction industry? Which is where you would find your low market value properties. <laughs> so, so I can't answer for sales, or we do is residential rentals. Our plus is working really well. Um, we've got, uh, in our portfolio, we're averaging 9% upside per property. So now that we're listed at 10,000 Rand, we're averaging 10,900 by the time the tenant actually moves in um, per, per month. So it, de it definitely does work in silos. I think that uh, when we identified the opportunity for auction, there were, there were two things really that, that drove us towards it, and I can't speak for sales. The first is that uh, information is far more symmetrical nowadays. So in two or three years ago, you have to rely on the other party, the nature giving you the right information. Now you can find it yourself. The tenant knows how close he is to the mall without you know, the land having to tell him that, which has made uh, it a much more fair bargaining, uh, a fair opportunity for bargaining, so both parties are happier. Uh, and the second reason I, I think that, that auction is working is because technology has become more secure. People are more happy to auction uh, online, and the way it works on the house, but you'll put a bid and you'll say, I will not go above this price, but keep me in first place in increments of 50 rand, um, up to this amount, I will not pay more than this. And of course, if there's multiple people interested, it's very safe to kill you. You're never going to pay more than what you wanted, but you could also get the best price available. Um, and, uh, and in South Africa, it's, it's worked very well. Our technology is a little different to what's coming out of the US. Um, we allow us to set a minimum reserve price here, uh, which, which I understand that they're going to do uh, overseas. I'm happy to take it offline. Alright, so I think it really comes down to the trust of information and stuff, which I just think has remained to come through here. I say that I think certainly property management has been better read. The last question here, and then we're getting closing. Morning, um, question for, for Ben. Um, on the house meeting platform, how does the, uh, the house meeting platform mitigate um, rental risk? As, as the first question, and the second one, for investors who have day jobs and that wants to enter the property market, that doesn't have the time for the day-to-day um, activities you know, that a uh, normal agent would look after. How does the platform cater for them? Sure. So I'll answer the second one um, first. We, we have what we call housing management packages. Um, they are once of cost and, and usually when I explain it, uh, agents really sort of don't want to talk to me afterwards. For 2,800 Rand, we will do a placement which includes viewings, photography, inspections, ingoing and outgoing, and key handovers. And for 3,200, once off, you get all that, and we will manage, as you said, the day-to-day -day maintenance, tenant queries, emergency response. We do all of that. So for 3,000 rand, we'll take that out of your out of, out of your uh, out of your day today. And, and sorry, would you just rephrase your first question for me? And the first one is, um, how does the platform mitigate the rental risk? You know, tenants not sure. Sure. So, so a very good question. What we've done again because of our data, uh, we offer a quarter-year guarantee to any house we land or replaces the house we tenant. So if a house we tend has gone through our credit checks, our, 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 uh, our vetting, our screening, we will guarantee that he pays rent. And if he doesn't, we will cover it for a quarter of a year while we find you a new tenant. Great. Okay, so I think that concludes the, the Q&A session. Gentlemen, I'm going to ask you this from Q, uh, closing comments starting with you, Um How do you see your world in, say, 10 years time, the future of real estate from your perspective? Um, virtual reality, augmented reality, share that with us.
Yeah, look, I'm, I'm no economist or property expert as such. Um, I just know that there will always be a need to buy and sell property. Uh, it's just the way we'll do that, like what these guys are doing, and using the technology we provide, making it more convenient, uh, 24 hours accessible to make those decisions, because ultimately it's going to be somebody's the biggest decision of their life is to buy a property and using technology to help them make that decision or to create that emotional hook is uh, very important, I feel. Um, yeah, I think virtual reality and online presence is, is definitely the way to go. Uh, to, to answer the gentleman over there, uh, we created a solution so that people can have a day job and you can invest, you know, from a thousand rand, you get all the benefits of having a mortgage, etc. For the rest of you in the room, you know, for me in the medium term, I think the beauty is you no longer have to choose between Cyprus or Portugal or England or America. You can actually now have a diversified portfolio in all those markets without the hassle of broken toilets and, and equally having the benefits of direct property so it's not fee laden through, through the typical um, financial structures. And when I see the future 10 years from now, this really gets me out of bed every single morning. You know, living in South Africa, I think the wealth gap is our greatest challenge. And 49% of the world's wealth is held in property, and yet only 12.9% of the world's population has access to property. And I believe that if we can get it down to $1 per person per investment, we can truly change the world. People say to me, we won't necessarily change their lives, but I believe if we change their habits, we'll change their lives. And our purposeful impact is to try and solve the wealth gap. In the short term future, I think you're going to see a lot of this intermediation. Uh, it isn't just tech platforms doing it, and that's quite an important thing. So, prop tech has become quite a nice buzzword again. Um, but a lot of companies are looking at ways to cut out the middlemen, not just in, in technology. I think that's the first thing. And then the second, and it, it speaks, and I think I'll just echo what Scott said you know, all, all companies have a focus. The privilege we have to sit here looking at what we call disruptive companies is to pick that focus. You know, 20 years ago, uh, people were just going to whatever opportunities, but we were able to pick them. And, uh, and the reason that we exist, that has me, is, is, uh, is, is to actually remove discrimination and, incre uh, and increase transparency across South Africa. So by renting out to a house me tenant, you may not choose if he is black, white, female, male, student or male, he's a house me tenant, he's a great tenant. Uh, and that's the sort of, um, sort of messaging that I think is going to come across the industry, not just in, in property, but in all of the disintermediation and, and the companies that come out, they will have a, an overarching goal or vision that hopefully uh, will drive a lot of demand. And, I think from our point of view, our short-term goal is quite simply to make it much easier for people to be able to sell their homes. Uh, a huge majority of our clients come to us because they can't afford to sell their home, which is a terrifying thought and just an introduction as to how high some of the transactional fees can be. Um, and there is a fee component to that and then there's a comfort component to that being able to supply sellers with an update that they feel comfortable that they're making the right decision with one of the biggest assets uh, will hopefully drive that. Right, thank you very much. Let's come put your hands together for the real estate department. Uh, really interesting. One out of four of these people are in fact in the real estate business. They're all tech guys, investment bankers. What will you, Humpty?